So in the last tutorial, we demonstrated why it's necessary to enforce this small delta t clock and why we can't rely on this delta t up here that's transmitted between loops that varies and that could vary in size and mess up our physics, for example, the collision detection. It might seem complicated, but it isn't really. So here is what happens when we're passing along the large big delta t's across each time loop. We're passing it into the loop, we're calculating our physics across the whole of this large chunk of delta t, we're then drawing, and then we're calculating our new delta t, sleeping for that big delta t, and then passing that new delta t into the next loop where the process repeats. But there's nothing stopping us from doing the following. Once we've received the delta t, the big delta t, we can actually chop it into equivalent small dt's that we define and loop through and update our physics one small dt at a time until we finished and that will enforce this digital clock. We then draw as usual, we then calculate uh, what new big delta t we need to sleep for to ensure that the frame time of this loop is preserved to the value we've requested and we pass on this large delta t back into the next loop where it's sliced up again and so on. So if you open up your game loop activity 002 and you scroll to the top we're going to add two more variables. We need a new physics rate and a small delta t. We're going to define this in our constructor so we scroll down to your game loop constructor and just after the frame times we're going to add our physics frames. So here's an example if we wanted 50 physics updates per second uh, we could set our physics rate to 50. 1 over our physics rate multiplied by a conversion factor for delta t because it's uh, in nanoseconds gives us our small dt. How does that affect our update calculation? We're going to need two. If we scroll down to our update I'm going to rename this one update big delta and it's mostly going to stay the same um, the physics though will take place in another update function for the small delta t so we'll just cut this straight after we will create a um, A small update. Double, we'll call that uh, delta t again. So this is what your uh, update for your small delta t would look like, and your big delta t will do the delta t check and. Since we're going to be looping through these small delta t's, we're going to be taking a delta t chunk of each time of our large delta t, a byte, until there's nothing left. So while delta t is greater than or equal to our smallest calculated chunk, we can still run the update on the smallest chunk size and then we modify our delta t value by just subtracting the small value we've just calculated. Of course, directly afterwards, we'll need to do our wall and floor checks. Since we've renamed update to update big delta, we will need to make a change in the game loop. So wherever we do our updates, this is where we name it, update big delta just at the beginning of our game loop. Let's check our initial frame rates. We're going to keep this at 5 like we did the last tutorial and we're going to get, keep our physics rate at 50. Now we uh, hit save and run. So even though our frame rate is still pretty poor at 5 frames a second, I'm expecting the cannonball's physics to calculate correctly and still hit the wall. It's great. We've now separated the physics from the frame rate and you can play with the values of your frame rate and your physics to give a smoother feel to your gameplay. But there's one, there's another problem actually.
what if we don't have an even division? So if we're taking delta t chunks off of our large delta t and we're left with a, let's say, a 75% size of small delta t, under the current situation, we're not going to simulate this and it, it could be a critical contribution to your physics. We're going to uh, go over that in the next tutorial. Thanks for watching.